Somerset, in the beautiful rural southwest of England. It's recognised today for its rolling landscape, willow trees, the famous Somerset levels, cosy picture postcard village pubs, which are great for Sunday lunch, cider, and of course the renowned Glastonbury Music Festival. But many years ago it was a very different place. Long forgotten is the fact that the Somerset coal fields, which covered several hundred square miles, were some of the most productive in the country. The black gold had been mined in the area on and off since Roman times. In order to get the product to market, there was the Somerset Coal Canal, closely followed some years later by its own railway and interconnecting tramways. The 20 or so villages and small towns, which are still in existence today, grew up around the pits that were dotted across the landscape. They are little more than part of the commuter belt nowadays and show occasional remnants of their past heydays as the coal eventually ran out. This is Vintage Murders and the case of the miner's daughter. back at a curious murder that occurred in 1909 and the reasons behind it, which were never fully understood. It is set in the village of Timsbury, very much part of the Somerset coal fields. Despite this, the area remained sparsely populated. There were around 4,000 people employed in the pits and the communities that lived in the area were close-knit. Life was tough and poorly paid, a life of toil and tears. Apart from work associated with coal extraction, the only other predominant employment was agriculture. Coal production had gradually declined over the preceding few decades, but there were still ample workings to mine at the Lower Conagry Pit, which was where Alfred Bunton had been working for the past 20 years. He lived nearby in a stone-built terrace cottage, rented from the local coal company, with his wife and four children, three boys and one girl, an average-sized family for the times. Their eldest was their 16-year-old daughter, Mary. People kept themselves to themselves in a neighbourly way, with families mixing on Sundays when they attended church or the local Methodist chapel. The menfolk would meet up after each mining shift at one of the two pubs which they frequented, the womenfolk rarely entering this male preserve. Other tradespeople had their own favourite hostelries, This division was not uncommon at the time, and local rivalries sometimes spilled over. It is with this backdrop that the events surrounding Mary Bunton arose. The family were much the same as any other in the area. Alfred had been brought up as a Methodist, and he brought his deep-founded religious beliefs to his marriage and the upbringing of his children. But it was with those beliefs came a certain unbending strictness, when at home with his unbending attitude to family life. After all, he was the head of the household, and as such would dictate what was and what was not acceptable in his eyes. It was commonplace with workers at the mine, after they finished their shift, to go to the local pub for a pint or two, and Alfred was no different from his peers with this pastime, except sometimes he would overindulge, quite often stumbling home late for dinner in a drunken state. By all accounts, he had a bit of a reputation as a heavy drinker, having been thrown out of pubs on several occasions. He also had a prodigious temper at times, not helped by his alcohol consumption, which he would, from time to time, take out in his wife on family, for no apparent reason. Violent rows could often be heard late into the evening after one of Alfred's late stays at the pub, which was heard by neighbours, who were no doubt reluctant to intervene. After all, it was none of their business. Mary, the 16-year-old daughter, had attended the local school and left when she was 14 years old. She had managed to get a part-time job at a local merchant's, and the income from this she would give direct to her mother towards the upkeep of the household, no doubt to the annoyance of the father, who would have preferred that it had gone straight into his pocket. In common with towns and villages today, with a main industry and employer on their doorstep, associated trades and businesses spring up to support the population. Blacksmiths, bakers, brewers, 
all the way to the carters who transported the coal to its marketplace, to grocers, carpenters and butchers. Pretty much what you need to live on was on your doorstep. As it is today, in the 1900s a large proportion of the economy and therefore continuous and regular employment was based on agriculture, local produce for local people. On a farm close to Timsbury, we come across a certain John Ackerman, a lad of 18 who was a labourer doing a variety of jobs for his employer. It was a steady if hard job, often with long hours. On his time off, he would venture into Timsbury and sometimes visited a pub also frequented by his fellow workers, none of whom would mix with miners, who quite often would revive long-forgotten rivalries. A harmless pastime, perhaps. But were the seeds of imminent events sown with a seemingly innocent division between the drinking community? How, when or where John Ackerman met Mary Bunton is not clear, but it seems that they would meet up on a fairly regular basis when time allowed, and a fondness developed between them over time. We know nothing about the character of John, and there's no reason to think that he was no different to any other 18-year-olds, but he would have been a bit more worldly wise, and perhaps be seen as a bit of a player with the girls, than Mary, who came from a fairly closeted background. It was usual to socialise within your own circle, but the friendship between the two nations would not necessarily have been frowned upon. Somewhere along the line, news of John and Mary's friendship and occasional meetings came to the attention of Mary's father, and he was not pleased. We can only surmise what followed from here when Alfred learned of the news that his daughter was seeing a lowly farm worker. Events from here on took on a sinister, and some would say, an unholy character. Perhaps Alfred heard the news from idle gossip in the pub, and in an intoxicated state, thoughts of his only daughter stepping out with a farm boy, of all things, fermented in his mind. No doubt there were cross words in the Bunton household, as well as tears of despair, as Mary was bound from seeing John. The firm rod of Alfred's background and beliefs descended on Mary, and put a cloud on the whole household. It's a racing certainty that Mary and John had clandestine meetings, just as it is her father would find out about them. Resentments built up on both sides of the argument, and it was these that spilled over one evening in the village. Alfred Bunton was obviously resentful and disapproving of the relationship, and John was resentful of, in effect, being banned from seeing Mary, whose thoughts don't seem to have been taken into account at all. Her hand was being forced, and her home life, no doubt, would have been a living hell. What should she do? Go against her father's will, however misplaced? Bow to the desires of her boyfriend, who would have been angered by how things were going? Dump John in the hope of a quieter life? The turmoil she must have experienced would have been huge. By accident or design, both Alfred and John ended up running into each other in the street one evening. Harsh words ensued, with John vowing to wreak vengeance on the family for what he saw as an injustice, and it soon escalated into a full-on punch-up, something that Alfred was no stranger to, especially when he was drunk. When it came to the full-on street brawl between a drunk middle-aged man and the younger farm worker, it would appear that there would be no real contest. Alfred, in his drunken rage, fuelled by the anger and dislike of John, would have been confident of giving this lad a severe beating. It turns out that the outcome was quite the opposite, with John inflicting a crushing defeat on his opponent. As local people spilled out onto the street to see what the commotion was all about, Alfred was left unconscious and bloodied on the ground, and had to be carried home, having been completely humiliated. This is not the end of the story, with the parties concerned agreeing to disagree and living under an uneasy peace. Instead, it's a start to a bizarre set of events that followed. A short period of time after the street fight incident, during a usual working day, the family were back to their usual routine. Alfred, true to form, returns home later than usual, having been detained 
by a visit to his local pub. Things were not well, as he finds out on his arrival home, to a very flustered wife. Mary had not returned from work in the afternoon, as was usual, and had not been heard from. One of Alfred's sons had been to Mary's workplace to see if she was there, but was told that she had left earlier, as usual. Her absence was completely out of character. How and why had she gone missing? Had she gone on a secret date with her boyfriend, who she had been banned from seeing? As the night drew on, Mary still did not appear. She was nowhere to be seen or heard from the following morning. News soon spreads of the missing girl, as do the rumours. A search is started. The local constabulary are out in force. Several hours later, after news of the missing teenager gets out, and a search is started, there is news. And it's bad news. A body has been discovered in a wooded area just outside the village, and is later identified to be that of Mary. She has been brutally attacked and stabbed many times. The family are devastated. Thoughts then turn to catching the culprit. Events move quickly. With eyewitness accounts of the fight between Alfred Bunton and John Ackerman, and the words exchanged between them, John is arrested and confesses he did indeed have an assignation with Mary on the day that she disappeared. He strenuously pleads his innocence, but as the self-confessed last person to see Mary, he is charged with murder. Satisfaction and maybe vindication for Albert on his views of the farm boy's relationship with his now late daughter. A trial date is set at the Bristol Crown Court for Ackerman to face the full justice of the law. The account of the trial is recorded as quite short for the time. Witnesses called, statements read out, and all the time John Ackerman repeatedly pleads his innocence, as often the guilty do. Even his barrister asks him to confess his crime. Such was the evidence against him. The jury retire on the second day of the hearing to discuss their verdict, which they do. And their verdict is guilty. The sentence handed down is to be hung. John is dispatched to Shepton Malick Jail in Somerset to await his fate at the hands of the hangman. At that time, hanging was still on the statute book for the most heinous of crimes. So, one would think that this is the end of the story, as Ackerman faces the gallows with his undoubted guilt, although pleading his innocence. But there is a twist in the tale, a twist that casts a very dark light, a twist that will stain the memories of those concerned for many years to come. Life returns to normal, or as normal as it can be for the Bunton family. The set routine as each day passes. Not so for John Ackerman, as he knows that with each day he is closer to the end of his life. The days are sunny and dry, with kids playing in the streets, as they did in those days, without a care in the world. It was on one such day that some children were playing in the nearby woodland, close to the colliery village. In the course of their adventures, they found something strange and out of place in the surroundings. On investigation, they discovered some discarded clothes under some logs, which were dirty and heavily stained, with what looked like paint. Just something else lying around to grab their attention, until the next something turns up. One of the more observant children, whose father was a miner, Notice that they were a pair of overalls commonly used by the colliery workers. It was customary for the mine owner to provide overalls for the employees, a kind of uniform, just as you see today for supermarket workers, for example, a garment not to be lost or discarded easily. The child took the clothes home and proudly disclosed the find to, by now, slightly perplexed parents. This unconsequential discovery however innocent and of no particular interest to anyone, was due to play an important part of our story. Out of begrudging interest, on inspection, the parents, indulging their offspring's delight in finding this item, 
discovered something that would cast a cloud over the village. By the label on the overalls, it could be easily identified as coming from the local Lower Conagry mine. Workers would not easily discard such clothing, which although was free, in reality was owned by the employer. Further investigation found a number on the inside of the overalls, which identified the employee to whom it belonged. The paint didn't really look like paint. News of the find somehow reached the mine supervisor, who was not impressed that an employee had discarded his employer's property willy-nilly. With the evidence before him, the supervisor summoned the employee to account for the reason of the reckless discarding of the clothing. The employee concerned was Alfred Bunton. With the recent events that had occurred and the family connection, it was not long before the matter came to the attention of the local police, by whatever means. And they took no interest. Then the gossip began. Murmurings around the village were centred around the facts that there had been a brutal slaying in an otherwise peaceful area. Bloodstained clothing found in the same woods as the attack took place, as well as the clothing being traced back to the father of the victim. Plus the matter of fact that the culprit had been apprehended and convicted. Coincidental connections or overactive imaginings of the locals. Alfred Bunton had, in fact, a perfectly rational explanation for the discarding of his clothing in the woods. One of his friends kept pigs and he had asked Alfred to come over and help slaughter the animals and prepare their carcasses in return for some pork for his labours. The process, as can be imagined, was messy, although a necessary part of the process. Relations with his wife have become strained over the years, no doubt not helped by his drinking habits and authoritarian approach to his family. Not wishing to inflame matters more, he knew that if he asked his wife to wash the clothes, there would be a yet another row. Laundry was the preserve of women, after all, so he would hardly do the chore himself. Matters escalated somewhat from an unlikely quarter, regarding the loin of pork as recompense for the pig slaughtering. Mrs Bunton would have been aware of all the gossip and whisperings in the area, and was quite intrigued about the pork, because she had never set eyes on it. The immediate thought was that it had been exchanged for a quantity of beer. No point in confronting her husband, as it would risk his temper kicking off again. Ackerman would have been hanged soon, so best to put all the traumas of recent events behind them and try to move on. But matters got worse for the Bunton family, if that was possible, because over the coming weeks the police decided to take a bit of a closer look into the death of Mary. Why this occurred is unclear. Persistent rumours? Certain parts of certain stories not adding up? A word in someone's ear? Or an off-the-cuff comment somewhere? There was a sense of unease surrounding events. A knock at the door of the Bunton House held it an invitation for a chat at the local police station. Perhaps there was a feeling that things did not quite add up, or that there was more to the sad death of the daughter which didn't catch the eye. It was pretty common knowledge that Alfred and John Ackman did not agree. They had ended up hating each other, all because of the relationship with Mary. She, in turn, resented her father for depriving her of the company of another whom she had formed an affection for. She was also torn between family and friend, and where her allegiance should be. Her father was adamant he would get his way, Mary was equally adamant that she would get hers. But then there was the curious absence of the loin of pork from the Bunton's larder. Alfred Bunton did indeed have a friend who kept pigs and had done some recent slaughtering. But it became apparent that he had done the work on his own and was rather taken aback by the suggestion that he still owed a loin of pork to Alfred. It was at that point that Alfred's excuses started to unravel and his recent movements put under more scrutiny. The night of his daughter's murder, he'd been at the pub with his friends, 
who was unclear for how long or when he left. His friends had seen him, but their memories, maybe understandably, were slightly hazy. Things were coming to a head, which would impact the Buntons and John Ackerman. On the night of Mary's murder, a fuller account of what had actually happened came to light. She had arranged to meet John at a prearranged place on the evening in question. It had been her idea to meet up, but it was not for a romantic encounter. In fact, it had been to finish the relationship with John, as the pressure exerted by her father had become intolerable and she wished for a quieter life at home, even if it meant making this difficult decision. John was not happy at this news. Indeed, he was angry at Mary's stance, and even more angry that the bully of her father, a man who had previously attacked him in the street, as well as his attitude to his daughter's private life, was impinging on his. Surely a good motive for murder. What words were exchanged between them is unknown. What is known is they parted and went their separate ways. John back to the farm and Mary back to her home in the village. Whilst these events were playing out, Alfred, having finished his long shift at the mine, went for his customary drink at his usual watering hole. Somehow he'd find out that his daughter had been out and about and seen in the company of John Ackerman. Now the angered father had had enough of the goings-on and was determined to put an end to this relationship once and for all. In a drunken rage he went in search of the couple and he would end the relationship for good, but not in the way he intended. He did not catch up with John, but did come across his daughter on her way back home and a fierce argument ensued. He did not believe that his daughter had finished with John and in a fit of anger, in the absence of Mary's boyfriend who he wished to harm, he lost his mind and lashed out at his daughter. In a frenzy, in his mind, there was no way that John would have her, so no one would have her. What must have gone through his head as he hid his only daughter's body and discarded the murder weapon and his blood-stained clothes? and then make his way home, as if nothing had happened. What motivated Alfred's confession can only be a matter of conjecture. The pressure of his lies being discovered, or perhaps his religious background, motivating him to confess the truth. Whatever it was, the truth was out, and the case finally solved. He was charged and convicted of his deeds, and sentenced to death by hanging, which occurred some weeks later, at Shepton Mallet Jail. But what of John Ackerman, who had been languishing all this time at the same prison? He was released a short time after Bunton's conviction, and would no doubt have returned to working on the land in Somerset. As to the Bunton family, little is known, except times would become hard without a breadwinner in the family. It is hoped that they did find some sort of consolation in the knowledge that the full truth had been revealed. Today there are a few reminders of this far-gone age in our industrial history and the people involved in this part of time. All that remains of the mines are some disused buildings, spoil heaps, most of which have either been removed or landscaped, and a few repurposed sites. Just as the mines have passed into history, so does the memory of Mary Bunton and the terrible events back in 1909.